Jennifer Weedman is a retired uh, Sumner County School librarian, last at Merrill High. So then, uh, and she's also a Gallatin resident. And um, so um, she said she is now a beyond obsessed. She collects <laughs> books, a collector, and a gardener. And I happen to know because we were in the master gardener thing together. And um, she is a history nerd. So, but for the past eight years, she has had the very interesting and fascinating topic of studying grave robbing. And the graves were robbed in a period of time when medical schools were starting up and you could not, uh, you didn't have access to bodies. So you couldn't go in and, uh, you know, no people didn't donate their bodies and the students had no way of finding. So this was done in Sumner County and she found, she's got slides too. So she's, <laughs> she's gonna tell you some hair raising stories and tales of body snatchers. <coughs> So your adventures will make you shudder and maybe laugh. Maybe laugh. So Jennifer Weedman. Hello everybody. Like she said, my name is Jennifer Weedman and I retired from Sumner County after <clears throat> so many years. And uh, love being retired. So now I can get up at five o'clock in the morning because I want to. <laughs> and you know, do my research in the mornings. And so back when I was in college, you know, I read Stephen King's book, The Shining. It scared me so bad. I didn't leave my room for, you know, a couple of days and I swore I'd never read him again and I and I haven't because I don't like being scared. I don't like scary things. I don't watch horror movies. Um, you know, that sort of thing. I don't like violence. But for some reason I am totally obsessed with grave robbers. <laughs> Figure that. Uh, it's just been a really fascinating journey for me over the last eight, nine years of doing research, and I will tell you why in shortly as to how I got into this. But tonight I want to relate some really fascinating stories, the really astonishing things that I've found out uh, about body snatching and grave robbing here in Tennessee, here in Sumner County, uh, Kentucky, Indiana. Actually, it happened everywhere, but my concentration has been mostly in that area. Now, some of these are sensational stories, some of them are disturbing, some are downright gross, and, but some of them are just laughable and really funny. And so um, I want to uh, relate some stories about the notorious body snatcher that was born in Sumner County and also tell a few gossipy tales about Vanderbilt Hospital and also about the relative that I believe was body snatched and taken to the University of Louisville uh, Medical School in 1876 for dissection material. Uh, so you're going to be amazed at some of these things that I tell you about how prevalent the fear was about grave robbing. We don't think anything about stuff like that anymore. We just don't. But back during that time, the fear was pervasive. And people did the most odd things to try and prevent their loved ones from being stolen from the grave. And so, and the last thing I will ask you is, how safe are you? <laughs> okay, so we have a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Let me get started. I hope I okay this is, this is my presentation is called a fate worse than death and Ambrose Bierce said that a grave is a noun for a place in which the dead are laid to await the coming of the medical student <laughs> 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 and there have been all kinds of movies like invasion of the body snatchers there has been the body snatchers starring, starring Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi and so forth and these were all, you know, supposedly fiction, horror stories, and all of that. But the things that I'm going to tell you about really did happen. They're not fiction at all. And some of them are just as hair-raising as probably these were Frankenstein, <coughs> Robert Louis Stevenson. Here's one of the little poems that someone wrote. The body snatchers, they have come and made a snatch at me. It's very hard them kind of men won't let a body be. Don't go to weep upon my grave and think that there I'll be. They haven't left an atom there of my anatomy. <laughs> so I have to refer to my notes here. So let's get started here. <clears throat> okay. Back in the day, 
Nobody donated their bodies to science. Just was not even thought of. Cremation? No. Everyone buried their loved ones with the thought of the physical resurrection of the body and the sacredness of the tomb. That was just the way it was. So this part was a problem for medical schools back in our country and they were forced to go to extreme measures to get the bodies that they needed to teach medical students. It was kind of ironic that everyone wanted their doctors to be trained to do surgery and to take care of them, but yet they did not want them to dissect bodies. It was illegal for doctors to dissect bodies. So actually it was the public and it was <coughs> laws uh, prohibiting doctors <coughs> from doing dissection that kept, uh, that actually created the job of body snatchers. And so, for instance, in many cases, the only legally obtainable bodies that they could get were executed criminals or duelists. Now, there weren't that many deaths by <laughs> dueling, and there weren't that many executed criminals. In 1896, just in Washington, D.C., they needed 57 bodies to uh, an average of one a month. Each college needed at least 10 more. So this gave rise to the profession of the body snatchers. And what happened was that, that the medical schools and the grave robbers came to rely on the poor people, the black people, immigrants, poor whites, nobody, all the people that had nobody to stand up for them. And so, and it was also said that the old, the infirm, and the inebriated were especially fearful because they were so easy to capture. And so slaves were also donated as well. And I was very disturbed to, to find that in Tennessee at one time it was a felony to dissect a white person, but just a dis misdemeanor to dissect an African American. Now, if you think there has not been a disconnect between the African American community and the medical community, then you need to think about the Tuskegee experiments and also read the book about Henrietta Lacks. And so, uh, as one frightened person declared, they cut you up like cheese and you never hear no more of you know how. <laughs> and it was a widespread that belief that the doctors would boil down bodies to obtain oil that would be sold as castor oil in pharmacies. That was a, tr a big fear all around the country. And the terror of grave robbers that they call night doctors was very real. We'll talk about night doctors in a little bit. It's not that anybody was really against doctors doing, being trained for surgery. It was just that nobody wanted to be them. Nobody wanted to be their loved ones. It was okay if it was some poor person off the street or somebody that they didn't care about. Just don't come to my house and take my family and so forth. And they particularly wanted people to be dissected that were to be buried at public expense to save the community the price of burying those people. Uh, there was a poem once that said, poorly lived and poorly died, poorly buried, no one cried. Mm -hmm. And those were the people that were generally uh, taken. But it was a fact that, that these grave robbers would often go to the poor African American cemeteries, they would go to the poor, to the pauper cemeteries, they would go to these out of way, out of the way places so they wouldn't be detected. And so Oftentimes, too, there were these arrangements with sextons of the cemeteries and with uh, superintendents of the asylums where they would just look the other way when a body was, was available. Uh, even in Nashville, I found out that the Potter's Field in Nashville was run by this woman who had a real taste for whiskey. And mm -hmm. she would take $10 and a quart of whiskey and she would just bury those bodies two feet deep and look the other way when they, were come, when they would come and take those bodies. And that went on for years and years and years. But really what I found is that the body snatchers really didn't care who you were. They didn't care if you were white, they were black, you were white, uh, you know, a woman or a man or a child. They didn't care. They just wanted the money that they could get for the bodies. 
Now let's let's think about this for a minute. Back then, say in the 1880s on up, a, a body could go from anywhere for five dollars to fifty dollars, depending on how badly they wanted the body and how scarce they were. Now. Um, that was big money for one night's work, and sometimes they could haul in two or three or four at a time, depending on how many people you took along. Let's see. Oops. Now, doctors had to figure out a way to obtain these bodies with the least chance of public outrage, because the reaction of the public learning of a grave robbery could be very swift and very violent. Back in 1788 in New York City, there was what they call the doctor's mob. And what happened was there were several doctors and students uh, working in a lab dissecting a body. And these children, these young boys came by and they peeked through the window and they saw this happening and this doctor foolishly raised the corpse's arm and waved it at the, at the child and said, this is your mother. Well. One of the boys' mother had just died. Oh. As it turned out, he ran home and told his dad. And so immediately they came back and stormed it with a mob, and they stormed the hospital. And these doctors um, had to be taken to jail just for their own safety. And the uh, next morning, 5,000 people showed up to practically tear this building down. It said the newspapers reported that the physicians were forced to flee in the dark places like hunted rebels or persecuted prophets for three days and three nights. And it took three days to finally get the crowds to go away. <clears throat> Excuse me, in 1900, uh, a Chicago a, a medical building was attacked up there uh, when they believed that a young boy had been kidnapped by a doctor and taken there for dissection. And it was all based on rumor and the boy had just run away from home. They practically tore the building to shreds and then the boy showed up the next day absolutely unharmed. Now, it may seem odd to us now, but nobody donated their bodies back then. Now, no, these days, nobody bats an eye about it. I mean, we look at television, we see Dr. Millard, uh, you know, dissecting all these people on NCIS or all of these CSI shows, and we just don't blink an eye about it. That's had a big impact on the way we view death and post-mortem things. Uh, but, as you probably know, uh, on, the, on Thursday, Dr. Bill Bass is going to show up again at Vol State for some lectures. And Dr. Bill Bass started what is called the Forensic Anthropology Center in Knoxville. It is better known as the Body Farm. How many of you have heard of the Body Farm? Okay. You have to look to see it. It's there. Uh, uh, by the UT Hospital on Alcoa Highway, there's a big fence there, and that fence was put up by Patricia Cornwall because she loved Dr. Bass so much. She even wrote a book about the body farm. Now, the body farm, what they do is they take dead bodies and they put them in all kinds of different situations, like they submerge them in a pond, or they leave them out in the hot sun, or they put them in the trunk of a car. Whatever kind of situation that a body could be uh, put in, they do it and they record the decomposition rate and this has helped uh, law enforcement to be able to determine time and cause of death and so it, in a lot of cases. Now, can you pack up the kids in a picnic lunch and go up there and visit? No. No. I don't think you even want to. No, not at all. The public is not invited. Uh, my son was at UT and he was studying entomology bugs and he got to go to the body farm and I said well wow Nick how, how was it and he, he just kind of scientifically shrugged his shoulders and said well once you get past the smell it was alright <laughs> <laughs> okay then so anyway the point here is that pardon this dreadful pun but people are actually dying to donate their bodies now to the body farm and to teaching hospitals like Vanderbilt one report says that the body farm has a waiting list of 4,000 people right now. And Vanderbilt has an extensive layaway plan as well. <laughs> now, what are the reasons for this? People are much more open to the ideas of this sort of thing now. But really, when you consider that a funeral costs 
about $10,000 or more. Most people are doing it as a frugal alternative to a funeral. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that this is a very, very important thing. And I would suggest you go see him. He is a very, very entertaining guy. I remember when I was at UT, they, um, years ago, they had a bumper sticker that says, Honk, if you've been married to Dr. Bill Bass, because uh, he's been married a couple of times. <laughs> he's a pretty good guy. Um, the golden, as long as there's been medical students in this country, there has been body snatching. I would say, though, that the golden age of this practice was approximately 1860 to 1920, although there are plenty of other stories earlier than that. Um, you may or may not know that embalming what did not really come into <clears throat> here till the Civil War. So, um, you know, that contributed a lot to this uh, body snatching practice, too. There's an intriguing story about Benjamin Franklin that he was probably not actually involved with the dissection himself, but he shared a home in London with a guy named uh, William Hewson who ran an anatomy school. And during renovations to that house in London in 1998, the remains of over 1,200 bodies were found in that house. So it's hard to imagine he didn't really know what was going on. So anyway, um, so medical schools began to grow in this country. Uh, in eight, let's see, around 1890 or so, there were four medical schools in Knoxville. They were bad ones. But they were medical schools. There were five in, um, there, were, there were a bunch of them here in Nashville, and then there was a lot of them up in Ohio and Indiana. Seemed like that was where a lot of these medical schools were, and that's where the trade of body snatching can be traced. <coughs> I'll have to show you a map of that I made once. It's pretty neat. But anyway, so as medical schools began to grow, the need for these bodies grew, grew uh, much more important. And so, Medical science was forced to defy the prevailing superstitions and dread about dissection, and they had to get bodies any way they could. As one Nashville doctor said, the colleges must have material, and if they can't get it by fair, they will by foul means. Now, material is kind of a euphemism for bodies, dead bodies. And you say, well, why don't they just call them dead bodies? Well, if they call them material, that kind of distances them from the body and what they're doing. Material is a lot easier to comprehend than that. <coughs> anyway, so like I said, religious beliefs and nervous lawmakers were actually the cause of the profession of body snatching to arise. And uh, would, would you believe that the very last college, university, medical school, known to stop body snatching was Vanderbilt. In this country was the very last hospital to stop doing it. And it wasn't until 1947, 1947 people, that there was a law passed that protected doctors from any kind of prosecution for dissection. That was 1947. I thought that was incredible. All right. Now, um, at first, it was the doctors themselves who would go out and get the bodies in a graveyard late at night, especially if the <coughs> deceased had if the deceased had a unusual disease. I, this broke my heart right here. This little article that I found in the newspaper: two-headed baby is given secret burial. Father who refuses many offers for the body <coughs> of the fools might get it. This was in West Virginia. Owing to the circulation of sensational stories concerning the disposition of the body of a two-headed baby born to Mr. and Mrs. John B. Cullen, the father has made public a statement that the body was secretly buried to guard against disinterment by ghouls. The child was born with two heads and one trunk and lived nine weeks. Mr. Cullen states that no amount of money would cause him to consider a great number of offers from medical institutions that desired the body. So if you had any kind of physical unusual thing about you, if, if you had a disease that they didn't understand, they were coming to get you. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right. This was, this was a shocker to me. But the tuition of many a poor medical student was paid for with bodies. 
if they would come to the medical school and they didn't have any money, the professor of anatomy, the demonstrator of anatomy, would often arrange for the medical students to go out with them and help with the bodies. And many, many, many uh, doctors uh, paid their way through medical school with, with bodies. And I also came across a story about one uh, doctor who, who was so, or a medical student, who was so poor <coughs> that he kept the suit that the corpse wore when he was buried and he wore it to his graduation. <laughs> and the medical, uh, the other doctor said, we just pretended to ignore the smell. <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> okay, so eventually as the public became more aware of this grave robbing, um, the doctors decided they weren't going to do it as much and they would begin to hire local talent. And so these men became villains. This was absolute fodder for the newspaper articles. Oh, the newspapers ate this stuff up. Now these people were called grave robbers, of course. Body snatchers, resurrectionists, <laughs> night doctors, sack them up, me. <laughs> cadaver catchers. Now, I do not have any pictures of actual body snatchings. Imagine that. But there were a lot of drawings that the newspapers and Harper's magazines uh, would put in and to illustrate what was going on. And I want you to notice as you go through these, it, um, <coughs> nearly every single one of them feature them stealing a woman. Now I wondered about that. And then I thought, that just makes it that much more horrible to think they got your mama. Okay? <laughs> so, <coughs> this, this is pretty <coughs> typical. What they would do is they would take they would bust in the head of the casket and they would generally put a rope around the neck and just drag the body out. Uh, I'll tell you another story that's even better than that in a minute. As you can see, another woman here, and look how, how absolutely ghoulish they look in this picture. This would probably be more like doctors, medical students here. That's, that's pretty accurate. And they would put them in a sack, double them up, put them in a sack, and take them to the medical school and drop them off. Oh, I love this guy. All right. This guy, his name is Simon Cracked. Simon Cracked, and I'm sorry his face has got, got that on there, but that's all right. Okay, the medical schools would hire a guy, and they would call his job being the janitor. And so, but his real job was to obtain bodies and prepare them for the dissection table. So at University of Louisville, Louisville, it was Simon Kratt. Now he was a German immigrant who worked for U of L, and he was supposedly a minister turned grave robber. And the people living in Louisville around the 8th and Chestnut were terrified of this guy. And they would not go around there at night because they were afraid that he would snatch them up and take them to the dissection. <coughs> and so his job was to procure the bodies and also to dispose of all the debris left over after the dissection. Now, it was said that there was this big, deep, dry well right in the middle of the medical school at UofL where he would throw all of this stuff and then he would put lots and lots of lime on top of it to keep down the smell and to make it disintegrate. Now, his first wife died really young, but there's no report of him having sold her that we know of. Uh, and then he, he married again, and this marriage was quite the stormy one, and it caused him no end of grief. One story related that his stepdaughter made a soup out of the contents of some garbage can at the medical school that contained discarded drugs, some poison, and who knows what else was in that. But anyway, so she served it to her family, and they ate it all up, and within an hour, all of them were writhing on the floor, violently ill. And it, and it said it took every skill of every doctor in Louisville there to save them. They, they did manage to save them all. Now, on November 12, 1875, he and his wife had this terrible fight. And so he promptly went to work, went to the medicine cabinet, and found a bottle of morphine and drank the whole bottle. And he told this, these two medical students what he had done. 
And he said, I'm going to die. And the medical students just laughed. Because apparently, he always was threatening suicide, and nobody believed him. Well, very soon, his wife came screaming into the medical center and, 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 and said, he's taking morphine, you need to you know, help him, help him. Well, they did everything they could. They even gave him electrical shock. <clears throat> I read this in a Louisville medical journal. It was an account of how they tried to save his life. And so he rallied for just a little bit after the electric shock, but 12 hours after he took the morphine, he lapsed into a coma and died. He was 53. He is buried in, at least we think so, up <laughs> in Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville. And like I said, we don't know whether his body ever really made it to the grave or not. Now, a newspaper account flippantly reported his death this way. Simon Crack janitor of the Louisville, Kentucky Medical University, recently committed suicide. He was supposed to have been temporarily insane. In other words, a little cracked. Uh, uh, well, okay. And so I have discovered in all my research that many, many, many of these uh, body snatchers had serious, serious drug and alcohol problems. Uh, I, I guess it would, you would have to to do that kind of work. I, I don't know. So anyway, so the next guy that I want to talk about, I wish that I had a picture of him. His name was William Cunningham, and he was the most notorious body snatcher in Cincinnati history. He was known as Old Cunny, Old Mortality, and Old Man Death. His name, all a mama had to do was mention his name and the kids would go to bed. They would do anything they wanted her to do because if she said, oh, old man, death's going to come for you, well, they, would, they would behave. And also it said that adults would not go around that area of the medical school at night because they were so afraid. And here was the quote. It said, they made it a point to avoid the area around the medical school at night lest old man death compel them to serve science before they were fully prepared. <laughs> And his description, according to newspaper accounts, makes him sound exactly like you think a grave robber would look like. Try to visualize this. Ball headed with a few wispy strands of flowing white hair. Eyes like a bird of prey. Tall, gaunt, bent over with muscles like Hercules. A protruding lower jaw from which nicotine drool dripped. <laughs> a permanent limp from being shot so many times on his snatching expeditions. One reporter said Cunningham has a face corrugated with age and crime. On top of that, he had this insatiable thirst for whiskey, and he was arrested many, many times for drunk and disorderly conduct in Cincinnati. He was not a nice man. Uh, once he got revenge on some med students who played a prank on him by providing them with a corpse that had smallpox. And the students promptly got smallpox. <laughs> now his wife, Mary, was equally scary. Uh, she, is she was described as a bony, brawny, alligator-looking woman who drank like a fish and had been sent to the workhouse frequently for drunkenness. Now he was said to have resurrected at least 100 bodies a year at 20 to 30 dollars uh, each to supply the medical schools. He shipped bodies all over the country. Uh, also to make extra money. That's a whole story in itself, I, I, I can tell you. Anyway, rumor had it that he even sold his own mother and father to the medical school after they died, of course. And in a good year, he made $2,000. Now, calculated at a 2014 rate, that would be $35,000. And that was just for fall and winter work during the college season. Not much grave robbing went on in the summer months, and if you think about it long enough, you'll understand why. Uh, so mostly it was done in, in the fall and the winter. And um, there, are, there are two little stories I want to tell you about him. He had clever ways to avoid being detected by the police. And one day he drove into Cincinnati in broad daylight in his wagon, and he had, he had a stiff beside him. That's what you call a dead body, was a stiff. And he had the stiff in a seated, seating posi seated position, and he had dressed it in a coat, and he put a hat on it, and <coughs> so um, he had on a vest, too, and so 
Cunningham kept his arm around this guy of the corpse to make it steady as he drove along. And so, uh, <laughs> every once in a while that body would double up and the head would flop really bad. And so then Cunningham would reach over and slap the fire out of the corpse and he'd say, sit up, sit up. This is the last time by God I'm ever taking you home when you get drunk. He said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, drunker than an old bower owl and you with a wife and children to support. And he got away with it. He got away with it because they thought this guy was drunk. Well, oftentimes, like I said, a medical student would go on expeditions with these doctors. And so this one young medical student, he was a, a, speaking as a doctor later on, he said, I went with Cunningham on expedition once, and he said, um, I was to go along and be the lookout while he did all the digging. So we went to the graveyard, and I looked over to see what he was doing, and he said, uh, I wanted to see how it was done. So he had broken off the head of the casket, and he had taken this rope with this hook on it, and he had put it under the chin of the corpse, and he was starting to pull the body out. And he said, help me, help me. And so the, the student reached down, and they were both pulling and tugging on this when the head popped off. <laughs> and while, while the student threw up in the field over there, Cunny just picked up the head, doubled up the body, put it in a sack, and took it to the medical school. That was the first and last visit of the medical student. <laughs> for sure. So, I was going to show you how he ended up. Okay. Now, he would collected a lot of money for himself over the years by promising his body to all the five different medical schools that he worked for. He sold his body many times, and so all these colleges thought they were going to get him when he died. Well, he did die on November 2nd, 1871, and five different schools came to claim the body. But there was nothing in his will about it, and so they buried the body, but it didn't stay there long. The Ohio Medical College came by and resurrected him, and they articulated his skeleton. In other words, they boiled him down and they, they strung his bones back together and it said that his bones were mounted in gold and his eye sockets were filled with a fiery sort of tinsel paper. Now this is not exactly like this one, but it says the skeleton sits on a tombstone and holds a spade. It wears an old hat and has a stump of a pipe between his fleshless jaws. The newspaper reported that he was not a handsome man when his bones were clothed in flesh, and he is far from beautiful now. <laughs> but it said for years afterwards that medical students would have an annual ceremony where they would lay a wreath down at his feet and a bottle of whiskey. And now where that skeleton is now may never be known. Now his wife Mary, the alligator woman that I was telling you about, <clears throat> after his death she took up <coughs> another gang of uh, grave robbers and she called resurrecting her bread and butter and she justified it by saying it isn't any worse to go out and get stiffs than to do anything else for the doctors have to have them somehow. Mm -hmm. That was the way she justified it. So that was very interesting. All right. I want to show you a very short little video that I found. This is Chris Baker. He was the body snatcher and deaner and a deaner is the person who's in charge of the dissecting room and the morgue and so forth. And he was at the University of Virginia Medical School from the time he was a small boy till he died. And they said that he never went hardly five or ten miles radius his whole life. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. <coughs> Here's Chris. College of Virginia is one of the most respected and esteemed medical schools in the country. That reputation helps newer aspiring doctors to Richmond, but one of the school's key figures named Chris Baker wasn't a doctor. He was a grave robber. We must warn you, some of the images in this special report might be a bit hard to watch. This is not your typical Mark Holmberg story, but it's one of his most written. have to dig deep to get to the bottom of the Chris Baker story. He signed his name with an X, but he taught doctors how to save lives. He uh, was so hated in his own community. 
and yet he was respected by the white elite, including state governor William Cameron. <coughs> he was totally comfortable with prowling cemeteries, but ran and hid at the first hint of lightning. It was said he could wield black magic. One of the key figures in the history of the Medical College of Virginia was born in the basement of this building right here, the Egyptian building. He would spend his entire life here in the midst of the bones from the graves that he robbed. Anatomy is the foundation of medicine, and dissection has long been the way to learn anatomy. MCV actually began as the medical department of Hampton Sydney College, and it began here in Richmond because there was abundance of clinical material. And that meant there were people without families, there were free blacks, there were slaves working for hire in the city, and you'd have ready access to patients and also ready access to cadavers. That meant there were men like Chris Baker at many of the nation's medical schools. Men who could bring in fresh bodies, cheap, about five dollars. Not many questions asked. Grave robbers, resurrectionists. But old Chris, as he was called, also became an uncanny master of anatomy. It said that he could usually tell which medical students would make it through anatomy. Before electricity, the dissections occurred under a skylight on the fourth floor of the Egyptian building. As was customary, budding doctors posed with the bodies that taught them about life. Chris Baker was often invited into those photographs. As Dr. Albert Pilkington, class of 1900, said, there was no more loyal member of the college than Chris Baker. Now the methods of preserving the bodies were very crude. Can you imagine the smell? Medical schools did require fresh subjects. Bodies that weren't fresh enough for dissection went into Baker's vat in the basement, where quicklime stripped off muscle and tissue. Old Chris sold the skeletons to students for five dollars. Blacks in Richmond hated and feared him so that parents reportedly scared their children into behaving simply by evoking his name. Chris Baker would get you um, either after the grave or in some cases they felt like he went out at night and deliberately killed people to obtain bodies. Reportedly, he was shot at numerous times. In addition to assisting all the students and kind of supervising the lab, he was responsible then also to the demonstrator and the professor of anatomy and meeting their needs. Chris Baker was known to haunt Sycamore Cemetery in Northside and Oakwood Cemetery in Northeast Richmond. That's where he was caught red-handed with his assistant and two white medical students by a police officer named Angel. Governor Cameron pardoned him and the General Assembly soon passed a law that allowed the bodies of criminals and the destitute to go to medical colleges. Even though Chris Baker worked at least 50 years among diseased bodies and harsh elements like mercury, he lived until June 8, 1919. He was believed to be about 70 years old. He died in the Egyptian building, according to his obituary published in Richmond newspapers. And while doctors attended that funeral, and many wrote of his legacy, the legend of Chris Baker has largely lain quietly, undisturbed. <clears throat> Now, whoops, now we know what he looks like. All right, this is Bill Gunter. He was the deaner at Vanderbilt for over 50 years. I read that uh, he started work at Vanderbilt when he was 13 years old. And he was in charge of the dissecting room. And he is also, although he, he kind of smilingly denied it many, many years, he was one of the chief grave robbers as well. Now, I went to interview, my husband worked at, worked at Vanderbilt in the Department of Pathology, and he, one of the doctors he worked for was Dr. Millie Stallman. I've heard, you've heard of the Stallman building and Jimmy Stallman, all that. Well, anyway, she was in charge, she was given uh, credit for starting the neonatal intensive care unit uh, concept. Well, anyway, I went to visit her, and because she, she knew him. He died in 1949, did I? 1949, but she was in medical school in 1945, and he was still there, and um, he had not, he was not body snatching at that time, but he was in charge of the, the morgue and so forth, and she always said that he, they always knew he had been a grave robber, but that he was one of the finest men that she had ever met, and she's just this little teeny person, and she said, and what I really remember about him is that he built me these steps so when I got ready to do all my dissection, I could go up these steps and get my hands way down there in that bottom. <laughs> and she just thought that was the finest thing ever was. I just had to laugh. 
<laughs> but anyway, um, there are many, many stories told about this guy that I could, couldn't even begin to tell you. But I wanted you to see a picture of it. You may have heard of Gunter Funeral Home downtown. I think, um, anyway. So anyway, that's very interesting. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Bud Rogan? I know Jerry Lumpkin has, for sure. Okay. Uh, you might want to know how I got started on all of this. Well, uh, I was looking through some books, and I found this picture of Bud Rogan. And Bud Rogan, who was born in 1869, died in 1905, was, Jerry will tell you, the second tallest man that ever lived. Isn't that right, Jerry? All right, some people say four. Jerry says second. I'm going with Jerry. All right, so he was eight feet, I think nine and a half inches tall, and he lived here in Gallatin. And so he, up until age of 16, he was just a typical kind of kid. Uh, in 1885, he went to bed one night, feeling fine, woke up the next morning, said that his flesh was crawling, and he was never able to walk again. He probably suffered from a disease called I hope I'm pronouncing it right, acromegaly, a disorder caused by the pituitary gland producing too much growth hormones. And the bones in his hands, <clears throat> feet, and face increased dramatically. You can see there's his hand. Now, even though he couldn't walk, he, he got this goat cart, and he had these little goats, and he would, he would get into his little cart, and he would go down here to the railroads. I will let Jerry tell this story. He knows it all. But anyway, he would get into his little goat cart, and he would go down and meet the trains right down here at the station. And he would have pictures of himself that he would sell. And people got to know who he was, and they would be looking for him as they came in on the train. And he also uh, was known to allow himself to be viewed at circuses. And he went to a few what they call freak shows, but he didn't like it. And he agreed to be in the Tennessee Centennial uh, in Nashville, but he left after a few days because he didn't like being stared at, and he was afraid he was going to be kidnapped. And so he went home. Uh, so out of curiosity, I just called the Rogans, and, and I, I asked them, I said, tell me about Bud, you know. Where is he buried? I'd love to take a picture of his tombstone for a story I want to write. And they said, oh, no, no. Uh, well, what happened was is that when he died, they buried the body in the front yard in concrete so Vanderbilt wouldn't get the body. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> Vanderbilt wouldn't get the body. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, Vanderbilt wanted the body because he was so big and they wanted to cut him up and find out why he was so big. And I thought, what? I never heard of anything like this. So I started doing a little research on it. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> how many of you know Charlie Lewis? Char you, you know Charlie. I asked Charlie, he was working with me at Merrill High, and I said, what's up with that? Well, Charlie knows everything historical, right? He goes, oh, yeah, that body snatching went on all the time, especially here in Nashville. So I go, okay. So I started doing research on that in the old newspapers. And I also was doing genealogy on my family, on a, on a uh, woman named Tabitha Penrod, who lived in Logan County, Kentucky. And so uh, she had been a patient at what they call the Hopkinsville Lunatic Asylum, which my husband says explains a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, she had been there, it's now called Western State, and she had been there for many years, and one, I, I found her commitment papers, uh, and she had been committed in 1858. And I love this, it said, we found the court case where she was proclaimed a lunatic. It said that she was attacked with curious illusions and has propensity to do mischief at certain days of the month. <laughs> okay. She died at the asylum in 1867. She's about 32, 33 years old. So I wrote to Western State and I wanted her records. They said, well, you'll have to have a court order. I said, she died in 1867. They said, we don't care. You have to have a court record, a court order. So I got one. And sent it to them. It took two months for them to write back and say, we don't have any record of her being here. And I knew that was not right. So anyway, I never thought that these two interests of mine would cross over, but they did. Oh, here's, here's Bud in his go-kart, okay? Look at, look at his hands here. Love this. Right here. And I will tell you a little... I, about the research in a little bit. This is how I found all this stuff out. But this right here, 
was the biggie. Gruesome find, 30 dead bodies discovered in coal storage at Louisville. 30 dead bodies were found last night in a coal storage plant in the rear of an ice cream factory on 8th Street. The same pipes which were used in congealing the cream for table use were connected with a small plant in a shed in the rear where they kept the bodies cool. It was at first thought that cadavers had been brought here from Indianapolis where many graves had been robbed. But the heads of the several colleges interested in the establishment asserted that the bodies were obtained legitimately by them from the penitentiaries and sane asylums and other institutions of the state of Kentucky. Several, whoops, se how do I get it back? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Look at this. Several of them were obtained from the Hopkinsville Lunatic Asylum. And I went, oh, okay. That's what happened to Aunt Tabby. She was taken from there because she's not buried on the grounds like they should be. They had just schlepped her up to Louisville. So I started in earnest on, on this. And so as I was doing this research, I kept running across this guy. And I thought, who in the world is this guy? His name was Rufus Cantrell, or as some people say, Cantrell. He was a 23-year-old African-American Baptist preacher who was also a grave robber. He ran his business in Indianapolis from 1890 to his arrest in September in 1902 but he, he is known to have robbed graves all over the country. Here's his prison picture. Look, I want you to notice on these couple of pictures coming up how they dressed them for their prison pictures. <laughs> that was very nice. This is Rufus Cantrell. <clears throat> he was arrested along with his gang, Isom Donnell, who was also from Sumner County. Sam Martin, who they said was the meanest man that ever lived. <laughs> William Jones, <clears throat> Saul Grady, and, and there were at least two white doctors that were <coughs> arrested, Dr. Joseph C. Alexander and Dr. Charles Wright. Now, the white doctors obviously got bail immediately, but nobody wanted to bail out uh, the gang, and so they stayed in, in jail from September 1902 to April 1903 when they were sent to prison. Uh, but Dr. Alexander didn't come out of it that great. He went through two trials. He was acquitted both times, but his reputation was ruined, and he was burned in effigy many times, and also his, he and his wife were pelted with tomatoes and rotten fruit whenever they went out on the street. Now, um, in reading accounts of Rufus's trial, I learned, well, we'll go back to him in a minute. Let's go back to Rufus. I learned that he'd been in the Army, and he had been sent to Utah in 1897 to be a cook. And so I sent for his record, military records at the National Archive. You could have knocked me over with a feather when I read that he was born in Sumner County. He was born in Gallatin, and he was born near Station Camp Creek. He was born, uh, he was the son of two former slaves, Reuben and Sally Lawrence Cantrell, I guess. Although, according to the 1880 Sumner County Census, their original name was Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Uh, they moved to Indianapolis when Rufus was about 12. But here's something that she said, his mother said, during his trial. Rufus is my third son, and he was born in Gallatin. <coughs> Rufus has spasms and fits often when we were in Tennessee and fell off a horse when he was eight or nine years old, struck his head and shoulders and hurt his back. He always preached and says he talks to God, an actual man. From the time he was little, I've seen him out in the field shout and hoop and holler and stand on his head and do everything when he had a preaching spell on him. He, was always, he always said there were angels hovering around his head. He claimed that he could ride a horse to heaven, talk to God, and return to earth. Now, throughout his life, he claimed to be a Baptist preacher. and He was well known in Indianapolis for preaching at funerals. Now, while in jail awaiting trial... Isa Donnell, who was his cousin, found out that Rufus had preached his wife's funeral. And right before burial, Rufus had taken out the body and filled the coffin with chunks of ice and wood to be taken to the graveyard. And so Isom was quoted as saying he was 
pretty sore about it. <laughs> and, and one person who knew uh, Rufus testified in this trial that the, Rufus said the reason why he wanted to be a Baptist preacher was that he could win more girls that way than he could with just money. <laughs> anyway, so when he was in the Army, uh, he didn't last long. Uh, his military records indicate he was judged suicidal with homicidal tendencies and epilepsy. But Rufus told tons of people, laughed about it, and said that he had chewed soap to appear that he was foaming at the mouth. And he said that the Army was no place for him because the work was just too hard. <laughs> now, this, he would, you would think that this guy was really insane, but as far as being a criminal, he was perfect. He really had this fabulous <coughs> memory. He could remember everybody he ever stole, the dates, what they were, you know, what they wore, and all of this stuff. It's thought that, they, that Rufus and the gang stole at least 1,500 bodies during his career and that he murdered at least two or three people to sell to the colleges. The newspapers called him the king of the ghouls, and he loved being called that. And he went to prison for grave robbing in 1903. was never punished for murders. Uh, he was paroled in 1909, got remarried for at least the second time. Now, we don't know what happened to the first Mrs. Cantrell. I do know that he married a Sumner County girl. And he pledged after he got out of prison he was going to walk the straight and narrow and never get in trouble again. And he just wanted to be a preacher. So he started an evangelism business. And the uh, last record I have of him is in the 20s being arrested for picking the pockets of the praying people during the, <laughs> the tent revival. <laughs> now he and another woman, not his wife, fled to Canada. And I don't know where he died. I don't know what happened to him. It may be impossible to know because he changed his name a thousand times. But I'm determined to track down everything I can about him. Now, that, that was his cousin Isaac. He was pretty sore about it. <laughs> Look at this guy. Look at the geography of this man's face. Okay, This man was Hampton West. Rufus and his gang were the African American gang in Indianapolis. Hampton West was the leader of the white gang. He and another guy uh, had the business in one territory and Rufus and his gang they kept to territories, and sometimes, though, they would cross each other's territory and they would have big fights. Well, they met in a graveyard one night, got into a big fight, and one of Rufus's men was killed. And Rufus said that was the only time that he had ever lost a body he went to get. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, Hampton, born, oh, he's very interesting. He was born in North Carolina, and during the Civil War, he joined the Confederate Army. And he... It said that he was one of Stonewall Jackson's personal bodyguards. Mm -hmm. And he deserted the army, though, and moved to Indiana. He was an outcast for the rest of his life. He couldn't get along with anybody. He had a, a tavern, and he would, there would be fights and brawls, and you can tell from his face that he lived a really hard life. Now, my favorite, one of my favorite stories about him is that one day, one of his neighbors was walking along his farm, and he saw that there was a big kettle boiling. And he walked up and he says, hey, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, boiling down. And they had a body in there and he was boiling it down so he could articulate a skeleton and make $40. Um, like I said, he didn't get along with anybody. Uh, anyway, he was sent to Indiana State Prison along with Rufus. And he died there in 1906 of stomach cancer. And it is said that he begged pitifully that his body not be sent to the medical schools for the section. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, I want to tell you a quick story here. This is the grave of Herman Spiro in Knoxville. This man was so afraid of body snatching, and this is in the Jewish cemetery in Knoxville. This man was so afraid of body snatchers that he begged his brother, should anything happen to him, that he would put dynamite in his grave. And so uh, Herman was a very successful um, um, uh, storekeeper down on Gay Street. He had a fancy store. Well, anyway, he was on business, and he, he stepped off a train, fell and hit his head, and died. And so they buried him. And then the, the next day, 
uh, his brother took out an ad and said, I just want you to know that I didn't put dynamite in the casket with him, but it's all around, and if you try to dig him up, you will be blown up. <laughs> now, there are actual cases where uh, body snatchers were blown up doing this. They really happened, especially up north. And so, um, <coughs> and we talked about a horse that accidentally walked over it and was blown up as well, but th that was the fear that the bodies would be snatched. And so, um, I want to tell one other story about Knoxville. Um, you, you know where the farmer's market is down, Market Square down in Knoxville. Well, the farmers used to come in from Sevierville and uh, different places with their produce. And they would, uh, it would be a long trip for them to, to make it for the weekend. So they, would, they constructed these huts in Knoxville where the farmers could stay. Well, there were four medical schools there in Knoxville at the time, and everybody knew that the night doctors were out to get you. That the fear was that night doctors were roaming around ready to just grab you up, put a plaster of ether over your face, knock you out, and you would wake up on the dissecting table being dissected. That was a true fear. <laughs> I guess you could say getting plastered in Knoxville meant something real <laughs> uh, Anyway, but every night, Every night that these farmers came to this place, they would bring along an extra person with a shotgun, and they would sit with the gun trained at the door of that hut to make sure that nobody reached in and grabbed them and took them to the medical schools. And that is a true story. Mm -hmm. And also, I did find another piece of interesting information about the fear of night doctors. So many people were afraid of them at night. If they had to be out, they would cover their entire body with lard so that if they tried to reach out and grab them, they could. <laughs> uh, okay, it's like, okay. that's crazy. Um, all right, so here are some famous people who had issues with body snatchers. Paul Dunbar, the fabulous uh, poet, had a deep fear of ghouls, and so what he had done was that they put him in a vault for two months, because if you were in a vault and nobody could reach you, after that amount of time, they wouldn't want you. So he was, he was put in a vault for two months and then buried. And Sitting Bull never made it to the grave either. It is said, it is an open secret that really the box did not contain the remains and that the guard was put on the grave as a blind. It is believed Sitting Bull's body is now in the dissecting room and that in time the skeleton will turn up either in the government museum or some other place. John Wilkes Booth. It is said that he was, his body was stolen but possibly for public e uh, exhibition rather than medical dissection. And in 1934, John Dillinger's family was offered $5,000 for his body for a public ex uh, exhibition, but they declined. Like I said, if you had a physical uh, uh, issue, such as Tom Thumb being small, he was terrified, and he was buried in concrete as well. Watson Brown was the son of John Brown, and in the Harper's Raid, he was killed and left on the field. And the University of Virginia, I think it was University of Virginia, yeah, uh, they got him. And so uh, it said they doubled it up in a sack. No, I'm sorry, it was the Winchester Medical College. Doubled it up in a sack, took it to the medical school. One account stated a dried preparation was made of the body and it was afterward used for teaching. And John Brown, he, the University of Virginia wrote to the officials about John Brown and said, if Brown is executed, please add his head to the collection in our museum. If the transference of the body will not exceed $5, we should be glad to have all of them. <laughs> now the request was refused and John was sent home for burial, so apparently John Brown does lie moldering in his grave. <laughs> so, but Nat, Brown, uh, Nat Turner did not meet the same fate. He was dissected, and it is even said that some of his skin was used for a money purse. 
And whether that tr story is true or not, to, to me that just chillingly illustrates the degradation and contempt that the section could mean. Now this just slayed me right here. This is an actual advertisement for, <coughs> this is why we have vaults, to prevent grave robbers, right? Many a devoted family marks the grave of their dear departed uh, with either a monument, frequently covers it with flowers, not thinking that the remains of that loved one is not there. Many a body, so carefully and tenderly laid away, has reached the dissecting table before the sod has been placed upon the grave. Many others have been devoured by groundhogs or other vermin so common in graveyards. Why run any chances with your dad? The Baker Metallic Grave Vault will give absolute protection from the vicious ghoul and the hungry vermin. Now, is that not horrifying right there? <laughs> but this was actually taken from, from the newspapers and they were all over the place. So that was one of the ways that people tried to avoid. And there's another one the Boyd Gray Vault. This is a coffin gun, and it was set up in the coffin that if the coffin lid was raised, it would fire the gun and kill the body snatcher. This actually showed up on um, Antiques Roadshow once. There's another one. They would put um, cages around it. This was mostly in England, though. Grave covers. Anybody recognize Alistair Cook? Yeah. Alistair Cook, now you may think that you're safe. <laughs> he was a famous broadcaster and he died back in 2004 at age 95. This undertaker and a dentist conspired together to chop off his arms, legs, pelvis, and other tissue, all without the family's knowledge or consent. His arms and legs were sold to a tissue reprocessing center for $11,000. But his bones were never ground up for surgery. Now, a former dentist named Michael Mastro Marino was arrested with some other of his gang members and pleaded guilty to, get this, selling body parts of some 1,100 bodies. He made between six and $12 million. And so it was revealed that oftentimes cadavers would have their bones replaced with PVC pipe to fool family members. And many of these corpses were found to have HIV or Hep C or whatever, even though their papers said they were disease-free. So a whole body can be worth upwards of $150,000. If you donate your body, you cannot make money off of it. But the hospital or the business that has your body can turn around and sell it and make $200,000, $250,000 on it. Now, this is not to say that body donation is not a great thing. It is. It is, but you just sort of have to know uh, there's a lot of opportunity for corruption. So, to end up, I want to just say, who knew? Who knew these things? You're going to go, uh-oh. All right. Some grave robbers specialized. They would get teeth from dead bodies. During the Civil War, many, uh, many a uh, collector would go to the battlefield, and they would collect these teeth. Because they were small, they were easy to hide, and didn't have to worry about it. It was a whole lot less trouble than snatching bodies. And some dentists used these real teeth for dentures. How many of you have ever heard the term rot gut whiskey? Yeah. Okay. You're never going to feel the same about it. <laughs> At medical school, bodies were often stored in barrels filled with rum or whiskey. And so, Sometimes these unscrupulous tavern owners would buy these barrels of old whiskey and they would sell it. Oh, I am not kidding you. And, some, and it says, that's the term rot gut whiskey. And the consequences were not pretty. How, have you, how many of you have heard the term sitting up with the dead? Now, that's an old southern thing, right? All right, you've heard that term. Well, people used to have funerals at home. And the bodies would be laid out, you know, there in the parlor. And people would sit up with the dead and all night to protect the body and so forth. Well, times changed and the funeral homes became the vogue and the bodies were taken out of the homes and taken to funeral homes. And so um, the old-fashioned parlor then became known as the living room. 
<laughs> I never thought of it that way. So, the things that I have shared with you tonight are just a teensy, teensy thing. I haven't told you about the horrible women that did it. Oh, gosh, they were just horrible women. I haven't told you about what went on in Washington, D.C. You think there's bad stuff going on now? Oh, my gosh. The body snatching going on in Washington was really, really insane. And I haven't told you everything that's gone on in Nashville. Now, you may think that uh, the scoundrels and the physicians who stole all these bodies were terrible people, but let's think about it, really. Some of them were certainly nightmares, there's no doubt. But where would medical education be now if, if they had not provided these services? Doctors wouldn't have the education that they need to, to perform surgery on you. And so call them heroes or criminals, but we wouldn't be as advanced today as, you know, as we are in saving lives. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. If you would like your remains to remain, and you would like to rest in peace and not pieces, it's best to know your undertaker. <laughs> Thank you. What caused the demise of body snatcher? Liberal laws, uh, where the states came up with the idea that everybody who was called friendless, that unclaimed bodies, uh, could be donated, could be sent to the medical schools. And then it started loosening up about cremation, loosening up about donating your bodies. So with more liberal laws to protect the doctors, that's when it really started. But really it kept going in the United States till about 1925. Any other questions? Oh, I'd love to hear about the women. Oh, oh, I mean, oh they're you, bad. They're bad. Really, you know, I was going to mention that Da Vinci, of course, back in the Renaissance period, sure was did. a body snatcher. Yes, he was. For him. Yes, he was. And uh, what about Europe? Was it as prevalent or more? Prevalent? Oh well, it helped, oh. if you've heard of Burke and Hare in London, it was it was everywhere. Burke and Hare actually killed people, you know, to provide um, bodies to the royal. Uh, Medical college there, yeah, it was there. Everywhere there's a medical school, there was body school. I mean, there was no way around it. And you know, I've been doing a lot of research about Sumner County, and, and I think it was probably a hotbed. I haven't got all the facts down yet, but I think that there were a lot of doctors uh, around here who were heavily involved in it. I really do. Yes. In your historical research, in general, do you find that a lot of our preconceived notions that we believe from movies and everything like that about different time places are just completely fabricated as a general nostalgia? If you really want to know how it was, you need to read historical newspapers. Um, there is a free newspaper, historical newspapers called Chronicling America that's put out by the Library of Congress, and you can go and do a keyword search. If you're into genealogy, if you're into history, just type in whatever you want, and these papers will come up. Chronicling America, Library of Congress, and also newspapers.com. They're fascinating. You can just go through these papers. No, I don't think our preconceived notions are anything like it really was. But the papers can tell you, especially advertisements, and the, the way that, that <coughs> and i tell you what I think was the most horrible thing about uh, papers was the racial attitudes. The way they talked about people and, and, and they, <coughs> it, it really made me sad to see how people treated each other back then and today still obviously. But you know, if you really want to know what went on back then, read the newspapers because they're really great. Any other questions? Yeah. Was there ever a problem in the old Gallatin Cemetery or any record, paper, newspaper things about? I do not have anything specifically about Gallatin paper because I have not, I mean the cemetery because I have not gone through all these Gallatin papers yet. But I know the city cemetery uh, downtown, Mount Olivet, uh, Greenwood, all of them. I remember I was talking to one of the leaders at the city cemetery and I said, well tell me about the grave robber. There has never been a graver. Oh, please. <laughs> Paul, please. And they don't read the papers. But no, it was, it was mostly the uh, cemeteries that were tucked away, didn't work, uh, attended very well. 
you know, or guarded very well. One of the funny things I thought about Rufus, Rufus was really smart. He would scope out all the cemeteries. And if he knew that the sexton had a dog, he would go and make friends with that dog, you know, about a week in advance and feed it treat, treats, and that dog would never bark. So he knew what he was doing. This guy, one of the stories about him, when he got arrested, there were two uh, detectives who would take him around and say, show me where you, where you did all of this. And he remembered it all. And uh, so he said, uh, as they were going down uh, one cemetery, the detectives, oh, did you hear John Smith died? He goes, oh, man. He said, you know what? His wife, I mean, his, he sold me his wife, and he sold me his daughter when, when she died. I sure would have liked to have had the whole family. <laughs> it was a business. It was simply a business to him. So, you know, it's been very, uh, I do know that his family owned four acres off of 109 down in um, Odom's Bend. They had four acres of land there, but then they moved, and I don't know, I guess it was just part of the migration at that time, I don't know, to Indianapolis. I think the father died, and I do believe that, and I do know for a fact that they were slaves of the Cantrell family, because at the trial, um, the mother said that my, my husband was Mr. Cantrell, you know, Mr. Cantrell's slave. So it's been very, very interesting trying to find information about this. If anybody knows anything, I need you to tell me. <laughs> For sure. Any other questions? If you have anything to, to uh, ask me afterwards, that's fine. I'll be around for a little bit, but I really enjoyed it, and I thank you so much. Thank you.